Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Our speaker today is Mulana Muri Rasul from Johannesburg. Mulana has been trained as Molvi, Alim and Fazil under the brothers Amiruddin, Mulana's Hamid, Ahmed and Muhammad, and Saleh Salahuddin. Mulana has written the exams of Darul Ulum Newcastle, passing all six years with distinction. He graduated with Daraja Ulia, the highest pass attainable by a student. He is also a historian and a researcher. His topic today is Reflections on Muslim Life Within South Africa. I would 
call dominant Islam. Dominant Islam demands by all and demands from all by any means a compliance. That means the institutions which hold power over Islam in South Africa. It asks for only one thing. It asks that you submit to it. Whatever the superficial differences of these groupings, these institutions may be, whether they be Yobandi, Barelvi or Islamic movement, at the end of the day and even more so in the very beginning of the day, when you scrape off the shallow and brittle veneer, they are all one and the same. They only want one thing from you. You must submit and you must forfeit. You must give away your mind. And the other thing that they want from you is they want the tentacles of expropriation, the tentacles of taking capital and money away from you with the terminology of Islam. Dominant Islam does not promote thinking, questioning, argumentation. These things, thinking, questioning, argumentation, are the very things that the Qur'an seeks to foster, encourage, nurture and sustain. For example, in the Qur'an, we have mention of the Suhuf, the books of Ibrahim and Musa. Now the Qur'an talks about the Suhuf of Ibrahim and Musa well. It talks about it in an Arabian milieu. The lingua franca there is Arabic. But these books, the Suhuf of Ibrahim and Musa, are in what language? They are in Hebrew, they are in Aramaic. So what is the Qur'an doing? It is seeking to promote an investigation and a deep and thorough knowledge of our history and of our sister religions. And what else is the Qur'an doing? It is encouraging a multilingualism. You cannot know the Suhuf of Ibrahim and Musa without a thorough knowledge of Hebrew, Aramaic, Latin and Greek. So do you see how the Qur'an works to expand our horizons and how the Qur'an as an imperative pushes the Muslim student which is every Muslim to a multilingualism. Now in Southern and South Africa, we should and of necessity must have as a fundamental non-negotiable, a learning culture that promotes and that makes of every Muslim one who is multilingual, irrespective whether he be Indian, whether he be white, whatever. Now let us look at ourselves. The dominant Islam, the hegemonic Islam, and again I am saying, this distinction of Diobandi, Barelvi, etc., etc., is a false distinction. And I'll give you an example about it also. This whole thing about Kafi calling, between Diobandiism and Barelviism was very strong in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Now with economic or monetary mercantile integration, the Oppenheimers of the Diobandis and the Oppenheimers and the Rockefellers of the Barelvis are marrying each other. So you see that entire discourse of Ye Kafir, Wo Kafir, Ye Kafir, it has been toned down. For example, in 1987, the Barelvi community, they wanted to hold a milad in Azadi. 
the elders, those who have a bit of training, you will know better what happened at that time. And so much so that a person lost his life. I, Maulana Munir Hassan, I was an eyewitness to that particular incident. So I know exactly what happened. And those very people who said, ye shirk hai, ye das hai, and hamare akabir ne ye kaha, or hamare akabir ne ye kaha, or thandi ne ishe kaha, or shah ismai shaheed ne ye kaha, today, they are intermarried with the Oppenheimers of the Bareilly community. In those very marriages, you will see that they are reading salami in the nikah ceremony, etc., etc. Now, and marriage is an economic enterprise that nobody fool you about that. When these Oppenheimers marry, so now they don't, when the nikah ceremony is taking place, and behind it are major economic mergers and major business deals that are going to take place. Those very same hum to muwahid hai or ye tohid ka masala hai, they don't stand out and walk out of the masjid. They don't take out dandas and start hitting the so-called Muslims and whatever. So this entire distinction is a superficial and false distinction. The Qur'an also in its promotion of a learning community. Let us look at other terminology that it uses. It says, Fas'alu, Fas'alu. It pushes the Muslim to learn and to ask from everybody and anybody. This is the learning imperative that pulsates in the Qur'an. Another learning imperative, another key term that speaks about learning imperative is the Quranic terminology unru and unru look into the creation it means one has to study without prejudice another key term that constructs and creates the Muslim as a learning person is the Quranic terminology of going out and learning in the world uh, it talks about from Shufi Manaki Biha, walk. It doesn't say only run mindlessly in the world. It says walk and look at the world. So what type of person does the Quran create? What the type of person is the Quranic ID? The type of person is the perpetual learner. And an example of that, we don't find that hegemonic Islam with its so-called Darul with its so-called madrasas and so forth, it doesn't create of us a learning community. Let us look at now the Economist cover is one of the key influential journals in the world. <coughs> All our super rich, the Mutawallis who control Islam, they directly or indirectly, they read the economist. And what is the economist showing us? The economist is showing us <laughs> lifelong learning. You see? To cope with the modern, with the modern world, one has to be a learner from childhood right up to old age. This is an application of the Quranic idea. Do we in our society have organized learning of which every Muslim is a recipient and a participant? and organized learning that emanates from every mosque. No, we don't. So again, I emphasize, Higamayt Islam is anti-intellectual. It doesn't want you to learn. And another proof of that now, Another proof 
of that is if we look at the institution of the library. It's very easy on radio or on television to say that we Muslims had great libraries in Cordoba and in Baghdad and the Beitul Hikmah and so forth. It is very easy to say that we Muslims had great libraries in Cordoba, in Baghdad, the Beitul Hikmah, and so forth. If we look at South Africa, if you look at the education of what is called the so-called poor white in Southern America also, you will find that the creation you will find that the creation of the library and the simple putting of a book into the hand of an individual was crucial to the development and the creation of literacy and capacity in these communities. Establishment of a library. 
Why? Because they don't want us to learn. They don't want to create the Muslim mind. As far as hegemonic Islam is concerned, there is one other important aspect that must also be looked at, and that is the political economy of the funding and financing of Islam. Islam must and of necessity be, it must have a sovereignty. It must have an independence. It must have what Shahid al-Islam Tabari Asani, Shahid Sayyid Qutb radiallahu ta'ala anhu, used to say, Hakimiyatullah, in his books uh, and in his tafsir, Fi Dilal al-Quran. And if ever there was an Islamic movement, I ask, why isn't Fi Dilal al-Quran read in abundance and publicly in South Africa? And if ever there, wa there was or there is an Islamic movement, why was Sayyid Qutbus Tafsir Fi Zilal al-Quran not translated into English in South Africa? And here let me tell you the unrecorded history of Islam. My Ustad Mawla Hamid Amiruddin Sheikh al-Kul fi al went in his days the uh, Tafsir Fi Zilal al-Quran not long after it was serialized in the Arab world it was translated by the ulama of, in, of uh, North Pakistan, what is today North Pakistan. It was translated into Urdu. And we went everywhere to say we need to translate the seminal work into the English language. And it never happened. So what is happening here? Islam has to be sovereign. Islam has to be independent. What do we mean by this? We cannot be dictated to by the political vagaries and the political control of the Middle East by the United States of America. Let me explain. You know now and here I want uh, to emphasize that Al Jazeera, I am not funded by Al Jazeera, I am not a promoter of Al Jazeera, there is no economic relationship between me and Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera is a world revolution in international media, not in media itself, in international media. And how to cope and how to combat Al Jazeera when you look into the sphere of scholarly articles you will find that they draw from Karl von Clausewitz and the military theorist Jomini they draw from military philosophy on how to combat Al Jazeera so what is happening now in one of its moves, that which is the global north, it is asking for the total extermination, the outswishing or the guessing to death of this media. And what else do you see if you read Arabic media? You will see that ulama are now on Twitter and goodness knows what else, calling Al Jazeera and Qataris and whatever. Once upon a time, takfir, calling a person a kafir, was based on so-called Akida. Now that age is over and we see, no, you are a kafir based on your national identity. So if you are a Qatari, you are a kafir, so to speak. And you will find it on Twitter. High-ranking ulama with blue, uh, uh, you know, authorized Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts. So what happens to us and in everything? 
you must follow the money. What happens to us now? Those there with their petrol dollars, they control global Islamic thought. So we also, if we are under those first strings, uh, what am I talking about? I am talking about Hakimiyatullah of Shahid Islam Sayyid Qutub radiallahu anhu. If we are under that control directly or indirectly, implicitly or covertly, we become signatories of that system of takfir. Now let us, let me show and I'm trying to demonstrate how does economic spending, economic control of the Middle East take place. This is a, an influential newspaper for a Sharpul right? The date here is uh, Monday, 26 June 2017. This was around the uh, Ramzan Eid or something. Look at this Iraqi child who is celebrating or is uh, expressing Eid in what is now colonized and nuclear destroyed Iraq. What is he doing? He's uh, celebrating Eid with a gun. Is this how a child must celebrate Eid? And with this, I'm concluding, of course. <laughs> Look at how there was a there was an announcement of a crown prince <coughs> in the Middle East. How is that announcement welcomed? Who are the recipients of the capital of that announcement? Who profits? from that announcement. It's, it says, Bay'atun wa walahu, we express our allegiance. Bay'ah. Who is giving bay'ah? Thales. Thales. What is Thales? Thales is an arms company. So this is showing you how the heartlands of Islam and the public good of Islam, the mineral wealth of Islam, it flows directly at the speed of microfiber. The wealth is channeled to things. We need an Islam in South Africa, which is independent. Thank you very much. And before I step down, I want to ask, I want to first express my gratitude to all who have helped me economically, who have helped me financially through the Institute of Islamic Services. I'm saying again, I, I've concluded now, we don't want to be ulama or anything like that who are signatories of this fatwa of Kufar. We, I'm asking you, me, Munir Hassan, in my individual capacity, our uh, brothers from the Institute of Islamic Services, in any way you can help me in my researches financially. If I will appreciate it and you channel it through them. Thank you very much. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We thank Mulana Muri Rasan for giving us his Juma lecture today in this masjid. Inshallah, we at the Institute for Islamic Services will be carrying out Operation Qurbani for 2017 in Bengal, India. All Qurbanis will be personally.